The Cold War began as soon as World War II ended, culminating in the division of Europe into two spheres of influence, NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Germany was divided into East and West Germany, and Eastern Europe was part of the Warsaw Pact. The Civil War in Greece challenged the freedom in that nation. The Berlin airlift tested American resolve. Mao Zedong's communists took over China. Korea and Indochina, renamed Vietnam, were both divided between North and South. But nothing caught global attention and heightened tensions as did the Cuban Missile Crisis. The new young president, John F. Kennedy, faced off with the Cuban revolutionary Fidel Castro and the seasoned communist Soviet premier Nikita Khrushchev. The outcome was uncertain as the threat of a nuclear war loomed on the horizon. What was the Cuban Missile Crisis? How did it start? Why was Cuba so important? What was the real story behind the event? Hello, I'm Colin Heaton, military veteran, historian, author, and welcome to this episode of Forgotten History. Following the failed Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba at the Bahia de Cochinos, or Playa Giron, or Giron Beach, on April 17, 1961, that was financed and directed by the U.S. government, primarily the Central Intelligence Agency, the Cold War heated up. See our video on that subject. Much of this planning and execution was due to the information provided by Oleg Penkovsky a GRU double agent working for both the CIA and MI6. Pinkowski gave intelligence that the Soviets were planning on building up military forces, possibly even missiles, in the Western Hemisphere, and Cuba was the primary location. The U.S. had no proof of Soviet plans to put missiles in Cuba, other than Pinkowski's reports, and therefore could not make any military moves unless they had evidence. The photographs of possible launch sites and improved airstrips, as well as roads to possibly transport missiles, should they arrive, fostered the plan to allow Cuban exiles to invade, but not U.S. forces. Following the Bay of Pigs disaster, Fidel Castro then appealed to the Soviet Union for further protection, fearing an even greater American invasion. And the Soviets responded. According to Khrushchev himself, the Soviet Union's motives were aimed at allowing Cuba to live peacefully and develop as its people desire. Khrushchev, who had openly stated that the USSR would totally support Fidel Castro and defend Cuba, did not believe that the U.S. would attempt to interfere with the installation of medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles. He was wrong, as Kennedy and his advisors saw the threat of those weapons potentially reaching deep into the United States. But the Soviets really wanted the Americans out of West Berlin, which they saw as a far greater threat than anything facing Cuba. If Kennedy could be forced to vacate Berlin in a tit-for-tat deal, then all the better. As Kennedy recognized, the advantage is, from Khrushchev's point of view, he takes a great chance, but there are quite some rewards to it. According to Arthur Schlesinger, one of JFK's advisors at the time, Castro did not actually want the missiles in Cuba, but Khrushchev, seeing the opportunity, forced acceptance as he needed the leverage. But the Soviets were also concerned about the missiles placed in Turkey, which could penetrate deep into the USSR before the Soviets could retaliate. And that was another bargaining chip that Khrushchev felt he could use if Cuba was the high-stakes game. Missiles in the USSR could reach Alaska and coastal regions of the western USA as well as western Europe. But the Soviet missile limitations meant that they could not reach deep into the continental United States. But Cuban-based missiles would change that. This was the threat of mutual destruction that Khrushchev wanted to present. Che Guevara, who had been in the Soviet Union, held meetings with Khrushchev the previous year and had already planned on bringing missiles to Cuba. 
In fact, in 1961, the foundation started to be laid for improvised airfields, roads to transport missiles, should the Soviets agree, as well as building nine possible launch sites. The first Soviet R-12 medium-range ballistic missiles arrived on September 8, 1962, followed by a second shipment on September 16th. The R-12 was a single-stage thermonuclear warhead. It was a single-stage road-transportable, surface-launched, storable, liquid propellant-fueled missile with a 1,200-mile range that enabled it to deliver a Megaton-class nuclear warhead. U-2 spy planes had been gathering photographic evidence for some time, and they noticed something was being built before the Bay of Pigs invasion. And these were later identified as launch sites for not just the R-12 missile, but also three sites for R-14 intermediate range ballistic missiles with a range of 2,800 miles. In response, Air Force General Curtis E. LeMay laid out a detailed airstrike proposal. While the military planned a massive conventional invasion if required, Kennedy held all that in check, waiting to see what played out. But once the missiles had been confirmed in Cuba, things moved very rapidly. For 13 days during October 1962, the world held its breath. The two great superpowers faced off over the Soviets placing their ballistic missiles in Cuba, 90 miles from Florida. This was the ultimate test of brinksmanship. Once the United States confirmed the Soviets planned to place their missiles in Cuba and had already done so, President John F. Kennedy demanded that the Soviets halt the construction of their missile bases in Cuba. The events that unfolded became nightly news around the world as both the U.S. and USSR played the ultimate game of chess and bluff. What is unique about the situation was that both Khrushchev and Kennedy along with a few select senior advisors, rather than their respective Politburo and State Department being heavily involved, made the calls. The events unfolded with frightening speed starting on October 14, 1962. That was when the CIA U-2 spy plane flown by Major Richard Heiser flew a few missions over Cuba and took several hundred photos of newly built and completed installations, as well as some in progress. The next day, on October 15th, CIA analysts studied the photos and identified the existence of launchers, missiles, and missile transports. Soviet ships had also been tracked going into Cuba for several months, but their cargo was unknown. On October 16th, Kennedy held a special meeting with XCOM, his trusted group of advisors, to discuss how to handle the growing missile threat. The Secretary of Defense, Robert Strange McNamara, offered three possible solutions. The first was to continue diplomacy with Castro and Khrushchev to try and convince them to abandon the project. The other option was a naval blockade of Cuba to starve the island country out and prevent any Soviet ships from entering, which was dangerous. Embargoes were in fact, or blockades were an act of war. The other option, favored by Air Force Chief of Staff General Curtis LeMay, once again was an air attack to destroy the missile sites. Others disagreed with LeMay because such an action might kill thousands of Soviet personnel, prompting a Soviet response in Europe, or possibly even launching a missile from Cuba. Kennedy, to his credit, decided to establish a quarantine, a naval blockade with 21 ships directed to perform the blockade duties and led by the USS Newport News command ship along with the carriers USS Essex, Intrepid, Randolph, Wasp, Independence, and Shangri-La with 15 destroyers, the USS Okinawa and USS Thetis Bay, and 14 amphibious ships, three Polaris-class submarines, four mobile support ships, and the guided missile cruiser USS Canberra from the U.S. Atlantic Command, commanded by Admiral Robert L. Dennison. This was to buy time, allowing for negotiations, resulting in the USSR removing the missiles. Air support included aircraft from U.S. Naval Air Station Jacksonville with 76 fighters, 157 attack aircraft, and 10 patrol aircraft. 
From U.S. Naval Base Guantanamo Bay, seven fighters, 12 attack and five patrol aircraft. From U.S. Naval Air Station Key West, 26 fighters, five anti-submarine warfare aircraft, and with U.S. Naval Air Station Roosevelt Roads, Puerto Rico, providing 15 patrol aircraft. Several nations joined the de facto blockade providing ships and or aircraft, which took place in international waters, such as Argentina, Trinidad Tobago, Venezuela, the Dominican Republic. Kennedy and his advisors publicly called it a quarantine since a blockade is an official act of war, which they wanted to avoid. Over the next several days, there seemed to be no progress in the negotiations. In fact, Khrushchev became even more belligerent. On October 22nd, JFK announced on national as well as worldwide television that the Soviets had created a missile threat, disclosing his plan to prevent Soviet ships from arriving in Cuba and other foreign flagged vessels would be searched. At that time, the U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union, Ford Kohler, sent a letter from JFK to Khrushchev stating, The one thing that has most concerned me has been the possibility that your government would not correctly understand the will and determination of the United States in any given situation, since I have not assumed that you or any other sane man would, in this nuclear age, deliberately plunge the world into a war, which it is crystal clear no country could win and which could only result in catastrophic consequences to the entire world, including the aggressor. The next day, Khrushchev responded, refusing to remove the missiles, which Khrushchev stated, are intended solely for defensive purposes. Kennedy's response to that letter was that he initiated the entire crisis by secretly sending the missiles to Cuba. At the United Nations, U.S. Ambassador Adlai Stevenson briefed the Security Council, telling them that U.S. warships were already surrounding Cuba to enforce the quarantine. U.S. intelligence also reported that they had tracked Soviet submarines, which were also in the area, which would be a threat should they try and intervene. The U.S. naval presence stopped ships going to Cuba. Many were stopped and dropped anchor. On October 24th, Khrushchev sent Kennedy a very strongly worded letter accusing him and the U.S. of threatening Soviet ships and the safety of their military personnel. On October 25th, the blockade worked, forcing several Soviet weapons transports to turn back, although the oil tanker Bucharest maintained its heading into the quarantine zone. The USS Essex and USS Gearing moved to intercept it which could have led to war, but Kennedy decided to let the oil into Cuba since it was not carrying weapons. The destroyer USF Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. intercepted and boarded the Lebanese freighter Marukla, which was cleared through the blockade after its cargo was checked. On October 26th, Castro sent a letter to Khrushchev asking the USSR to launch a nuclear first strike against the United States. Even Khrushchev knew that this was insane, and he sent a letter to JFK asking him to help him in reducing the tensions to ensure that they didn't doom the world to the catastrophe of thermonuclear war. On October 27th, U-2 pilot Major Rudolf Anderson was shot down and killed over Cuba. This was first blood, and several high-ranking U.S. officials wanted retaliation. Upon hearing the news, Assistant Secretary of Defense Paul Nitze said they fired the first shot, and JFK responded, we are now in an entirely new ballgame. However, JFK decided that Khrushchev had not personally given the order to shoot down the U-2. Both men understood that the situation was seriously getting out of their control. Khrushchev also had to have understood that starting a war even a conventional one so far from Mother Russia would not end well, as NATO would have then come on board. Khrushchev considered a new option, and he sent another letter to JFK saying that if NATO removes their missiles from Turkey, the USSR will comply and follow suit in Cuba. JFK then promised not to invade Cuba once the Soviets left. 
As soon as JFK read the letter, he met with his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy, who then met with Soviet Ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin, agreeing to remove the missiles from Turkey. On October 27th, the agreement was done, and the deal was sealed, and the letter was sent to Kennedy saying that the missiles would be removed from Cuba. The two men managed to set aside egos and establish an agreement that prevented a Third World War. Khrushchev had to save face, and Kennedy had to project strength without hubris. Eventually, both men did the right thing to their collective credit. By December 1962, all the missiles had been removed from Cuba and returned to the Soviet Union following a breakdown between Castro and Khrushchev due to the insistence of Che Guevara that the missiles be handed over to Cuban control. Anastas Mikoyan in Havana was tasked with dealing with Castro in a delicate balancing act not to damage the Cuban-Soviet relationship as Castro had become paranoid that the USSR and USA had made a backdoor agreement that would not benefit Cuba. In a sense, Castro was correct, but McGoigan explained to Khrushchev, who agreed that the erratic homicidal Guevara and swayable desperate Castro should never have access to nuclear weapons. That factor alone proves the critical nature of the detente that occurred during those two weeks in October when the world held its breath. Thanks for watching today's episode of Forgotten History. If you like this episode, please consider becoming a channel member or joining our Patreon page. This would help us offset the ever-increasing cost of production. As always, please like, share, and comment. And if you have any show ideas, please contact us, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Until next time.